Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. I'm Stephen Saum, your moderator, and I'm pleased to be with you here today, though it's very much with mixed feelings, uh, as this is a conversation that hits very close to home, home for me and, and for many. Years ago, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Ukraine, and I've also observed elections across the country. And like many, I have friends, colleagues, and former students who are in harm's way. It's been almost four months since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and the crisis for Ukrainians only deepens. Even if the shelling and rocket attacks stopped tomorrow, this conflict-driven mass displacement will continue to impact millions within Ukraine, across Europe, and around the globe. As we mark World Refugee Day, we are focusing on the strength and courage of more than 13 million people forced to flee their homes in Ukraine. The United Nations estimates today that more than 5 million have fled to neighboring countries or beyond, and another 8 million are believed to be displaced within Ukraine itself. Among the many thousands who have answered the call to help during this time of crisis are Ostap Korkuna and Joy Sisiski. Ostap Korkuna is the co-chairman of the nonprofit Nova Ukraine and holds a career as a software engineer. Born and raised in Lviv, Ukraine, his work at Nova Ukraine helps, aims to help Ukraine and raise awareness in the United States and around the world through the volunteer organization. Joy Sisiski has just been named the new CEO of the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund here in the Bay Area. Congratulations to Joy on this well-deserved appointment. She has over 20 years of experience working at Jewish organizations on a variety of subjects, and she recently spent time traveling to the border between Ukraine and Poland to stand witness at this monumental time in history to provide relief and welcome Ukrainian Jewish families at the start of their very long journeys. Now, before I bring Joy and Ostap up on stage with me, I'd like to share two short videos about the work that Nova Ukraine and the Jewish Community Federation are doing to raise awareness and harness resources to help people in need. in Warsaw. There are thousands of people that are getting off buses and trains. You can see behind me there are just tons of tents set up everywhere. Uh, one has water, one has clothing, there's one where you can get diapers and wipes and uh, just kind of essential supplies. All day we have news that uh, in some district of Kiev uh, bombs we have uh, bombing uh, houses, kindergartens, yes, schools, houses, schools, uh, nursery schools. Yeah. And it was very dangerous to stay there. So we decided to, to go away. We don't know where exactly we should go, but we were very scared and uh, we know exactly that we should go anywhere. Here at the Poland-Ukraine border, Medeka, with Darek, 
incredible heroic JDC volunteer. And uh, we're here with the JFNA uh, mission of 30 leaders from across uh, North America to assess what's going on here at the border. And I can tell you uh, it's, it's incredible to have the JDC and all the volunteers here helping these thousands of refugees that are streaming across the border, along with all the other humanitarian organizations, to help and make sure that they, people here get to safety and rescue. It's very heartbreaking to see people coming with their uh, maybe one piece of luggage, all their belongings in a shopping cart, streaming through with young children, elderly. We as a Jewish community, thankfully, with a strong state of Israel through JDC, can do these heroic efforts with the great professionals on the ground. Happy face and welcoming face. That we are trying to, we are trying yeah. to, and we also have a tent with like sleeping bags and, and uh, uh, toys for the children. In 24th February, start the war. And the first three days, we didn't believe it. We didn't believe it. Husband told me, you have 15 minutes, take what you need and go. Just save our children, go, go. And I took some, some documents and I took uh, the clothes of me on me. And the all night I took my daughter on my hands and I didn't feel my hands at the end. Uh, from the bus station we took the taxi and come here. That man told us that we should come to this hotel and here somebody help us. We have invested already hundreds of millions of dollars in building Jewish life in Ukraine and there are people that are that are there that need us and people that will go back and I think uh, the thing that is most important to me is what we can do now to be thinking about the long term. It's our responsibility not just to be have this, the, all these emotions going through us, but to take that home and to do something really important and significant with it and to you know, make a lasting commitment to what's happening here. Um, so maybe, maybe someday never again really means never again. Uh, but I think, I think for me, it's just this, I just feel overcome by this sense of enormous responsibility of having, having had this privilege and now... Thank you so much for, for joining us here today and, and helping people understand the work that you've been doing and the organizations that you represent uh, have been doing and, and why, it's, why it's so important. Um, I'll step if we, if we might begin with, with Nova Ukraine. Um, I'm curious because I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, you established the organization in 2014. Um, that Ukrainians came together, when Ukrainians came together is in what's become known as the Revolution of Dignity, right? And then Putin seized Crimea, invaded the Donbass, um, and Nova Ukraine was formed to address the crisis. Can you tell us about that and, and how that has led to the, the work that you're doing now? Definitely. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you for having me uh, today so I can share some work with my of the team. Um, you're right. Nova Ukraine uh, was started more than eight years ago. Um, unfortunate events caused us to start the work back then, and unfortunate events uh, uh, actually, you know, leading to us continuing and scaling up our work, uh, but we, we see that as our mission. We started in 2000, in fact, the group of people who eventually founded Nova Ukraine started in 2013 when the Revolution of Dignity started uh, in Ukraine. And we wanted to support it, we wanted to find a way to help, and we, we just established a um, sort of in, informal organization called Maidan San Francisco. So and similar to Maidan in Kyiv, we had our little Maidan here, and quickly we realized how much the support of uh, people from more than you know, 10,000 miles away uh, is important for Ukrainians. Um, and we kept going, but we also knew that uh, Maidan will finish eventually, and we wanted to turn this, this wave of, um, of support into something more sustainable. So we decided to 
uh, create a nonprofit. Um, so we registered Nova Ukraine, and uh, that that was in 2014. 14, um, quickly realized that there was much more work for us to do, and we started with um, just supporting families of Heavenly Hundred, but quickly had to support internally displaced people. Um, found um, other a lot of projects. There is so much work that that uh, has to be done on the ground to support the development uh, of Ukraine. Um, and there was a number of different projects. We focused on um, just raising awareness about Ukraine, explaining people what, what's happening, uh, kind of first-hand um, experience, and um, also um, helping provide humanitarian aid, obviously, to Ukraine, to mostly to those people who are, um, who are less fortunate, and um, you know, kids in orphanages or internally displaced people or kids who lost their parents due to war, unfortunately. Um, so that, that was a big focus. And another focus was actually uh, helping develop the civil society, the strong civil society in Ukraine. Uh, we believe that's a big investment, and we want to, we can't wait to go back to working on that, to invest into education, to invest into, into the future of Ukraine. Um, that being said, right now, February 24th, we had to put all projects on hold and focus solely on providing humanitarian aid to Ukraine. Um, that has been our focus for the past um, close to four months now. Um, so that's a very short story of now Ukraine. Happy to share more in terms of specific projects or directions. Uh, but we've been supported by um, thousands of donors uh, over the years, and uh, our team has grown to a couple of hundred volunteers. And there are more than 3,000 volunteers on the ground in Ukraine that we partner with and work with. Uh, with some of them are parts of organizations on the ground. Some of them are just individual volunteers that we work with. And this is basically a network of people who um, decided that they, they, want to, um, they, they want to do something and help uh, that we rely on to, to, to fulfill our mission, basically. Yeah, thank you. And I think you, you've, you've br underscored a couple of really important points, I think, about, you know, one, the larger commitment to building for the future, right? I mean, kind of when the crisis is over, the work is not done, right? That's when you can get back to the work that you want to do. And I think maybe for audience members who don't know, you, you mentioned the Heavenly Hundred, right? Those being the people who were killed during the Revolution of Dignity and, um, and wanting to support and honor those, their, their families. Joy, you're also part of an organization, you lead an organization that has been involved with working with a sense of history and building for the future for, for some time um, and has, has pivoted here during, during the crisis as well. Can you tell us about um, what, what uh, your organization has, has been doing? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for having me and for all of your good work that you're doing at this, at this time. The Jewish Federation, uh, Jewish Community Federation Endowment Fund has been here and operating in the Bay Area for more than 100 years years. And our overseas partner is the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. And uh, there are uh, millions of Jews that live all over the world, including more than 200,000 Jews that live in Ukraine. And so we've been working there for um, about 30 years since the fall of the Iron Curtain through our global partner, JDC. And we operate um, right now 18 chesed welfare system uh, centers. Chesed in Hebrew means compassion. And it's a place where um, mostly the elderly and the vulnerable in our Jewish community can come together for food, clothing, social activities, and a way to build community in addition to Jewish community centers across um, the country of Ukraine. And we operate these kinds of um, chesed welfare centers across the former Soviet Union. So it's a hallmark of the kind of renewal of Jewish life that we've seen since the fall of the Iron Curtain and also since the Holocaust. And as we saw in the video, right, you, you traveled within the first few weeks of the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, to the, the border with, with Poland. Uh, can you talk talk about that? Yeah, I mean, we were there. I was there with um, our board chair, Arthur Slepian, uh, in the first three weeks of the war, and it was immediate. We knew that we would go with um, some of our uh, fellow colleagues from around the country. There are 150 Jewish federations across the country. We've raised um, together more than $60 million to support both the Jewish community and general community in Ukraine since the start of the war. But one of the first things that we felt was really important to do was 
um, to bear witness at this time. Um, there are a lot of people still with misinformation that didn't really know what was happening and that it would be important to see for ourselves and bring these stories home to our community to share with others. We found that a lot of the people we met with, refugees, uh, were very eager to tell their stories because they themselves could hardly believe that this was happening to them. And they wanted to make sure that the world saw and to be able to bear witness to the atrocities is um, a very special um, kind of responsibility. And then to, to, to be able to bring back and mobilize a community towards action. And we, of course, also wanted to meet people um, who were literally, when we were there, thousands of people streaming through the border gates just with compassion, with a hug, with food, with water. And our group also volunteered right there at the border. They were some of the, we were some of the first people that they saw. And I think it's important for people to feel welcomed uh, when they're on a really difficult journey. And Ostap, you have, of course, family who are in, uh, in Lviv, and your wife's family is also in, in Kiev, as I understand. Correct, yes. Um, that's where I'm originally from, um, and my, my wife is, is from Kiev. Um, obviously, from the first days, our initial reaction was to check in our family daily, um, attempting to, to move them to a safe place. That being said, uh, well, Western Ukraine feels a little safer, um, there is no absolutely safe place on, in Ukraine right now because shelling and bombing is happening uh, in everywhere on the territory of Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, all of our social connections and family connections are back in Ukraine, and this what makes it especially important for us. Um, so we can do, it, do this for them and, and for, for all the other people um, there. That's, I mean, the fact that you mentioned that there's no, no safe place in Ukraine, right? I mean, we've, we talked about the numbers of people who have been displaced and, and talked about even since 2014 that there were you know, a million people who were already internally displaced because of the, the, the Russian invasion of Donbass. Um, I wonder if either of you can, can talk about, you know, even surviving this, right? And when the rockets stop f falling, when, when the shelling stops, um, um, what it will mean to try to assist people or work with people who have endured this trauma. I mean, children who have lost parents, um, others who have, who have lost loved ones, um, and who have endured the, the shelling, endured occupation, um, all of these things. The, these are very hard topics, Steve, and, and it's very hard to really like fully internalize what these people are going through. Um, even what the volunteers talking to, to people and listening to these stories uh, in a second hand, um, they are affected. Um, and I can't even imagine how, how, what kind of stress people go through. And some people manage to evacuate, escape, uh, relocate at the very beginning. Um, some abroad, some within Ukraine. Um, one thing that is so important to, to highlight is um, how many families have been split because mm -hmm. um, you as you've seen in the video at the beginning uh, you probably noticed that most most people are women and children uh, and uh, that's because men cannot leave uh, the country right now because there is a military order um, so that that adds like an ad additional um, additional complexity to the entire situation um, and what people go through as they have to leave their home uh, we had to uh, participate in evacuations of people, including evacuations from um, very dangerous places, from Mariupol, when Mariupol was already under siege, um, most of it. Um, that's a very uh, absolutely risky operation from the volunteers' perspective, but obviously for, for the people who, who, choose that, who choose that pass. Um, it, there are just a lot of challenges, starting with just the danger of, of being outside. Um, and even, even we've all seen uh, bombing of buildings where you know, the children was written on it. Um, so e even that did not, did not prevent, uh, did not bring any kind of um, sa safety. Um, and people who have managed to relocate, they're still, uh, now they are facing the problem of where do they get uh, housing? Where do they live? Where do they get basic supplies? Um, and it's not always even a problem of, of money. 
it's also the problem of supply. Supply chains were just stopped. And one thing that we noticed on the ground when we started uh, to, to, to deliver help on the ground, we, we noticed that uh, the, one of the biggest problem is the supply chains. Like people cannot go to the, to the grocery, they can't go to the pharmacy. They can't get anything. That's why even basic things like basic medicine have to be delivered. And some people are not uh, mobile, right? Mm -hmm. And they can't go to the bomb shelter, can't go to the distribution place. Um, all of those are just very, really hard problems that uh, we are trying to make a dent in that um, we, we estimate that we managed to help um, close to 2 million people now um, one way or another by providing f meals or food packages or basic medicine. Um, but there is just so much, so much more uh, help that is needed on the ground. And, and Joy, you've, you've spoken about needing to help the most vulnerable and the elderly is, is yes. part of the work that you've so, done. Yes, uh, so, and many of the stories that we heard of refugees were, were exactly as you described it. People had maybe 15 minutes to decide if they were going to go. Um, they were organizing transportation through our partners um, and through anybody who could get them a ride and neighbors coming together, maybe yelling to say, you know, we have just a few minutes to decide. They grabbed their documents and they, they just ran with nothing with them. So they also arrive traumatized because they left very quickly, unexpectedly. A lot of people we met didn't think that this war would escalate in the way that it did and as quickly. Um, and most, m many people that we saw, not most, but many people we saw coming across the border also had pets with them, which really surprised me. Dogs, cats, birds, you name it. And they had come with nothing else but what was most important to them. Of the 200,000 Jews that are living there, about uh, 40,000 of them are considered especially vulnerable. They're at-risk families that are living in poverty or the elderly. And many of them, um, also as you described, are homebound. Many of them are bedridden. And the support that we already provide them um, to visit them in their home, to bring them food and medicine, was continuing at least in the early days of the war because uh, many people couldn't escape to a bomb shelter. Um, they couldn't leave their homes or their beds. So the healthcare workers through our Chesed volunteer welfare centers were staying. 80% of them are women that are social workers. Their husbands or families may have moved on to other parts of the country to try and flee. But many of them stayed and they spent the night with their clients because they were scared to be alone and they couldn't leave leave. And some of the most complicated evacuations, and you know, when you really think about trauma, many people are, are reliving multiple traumas, including um, there are about 1,000 Holocaust survivors, uh, sorry, 10,000 Holocaust survivors, and about 100 of them uh, were bedridden or especially sick or vulnerable and needed to be evacuated. And for each one of those people, about 100 that were evacuated, it took 50 people to get them across three countries. We did this in partnership with the Claims Conference, which provides material benefits to Holocaust survivors by the German government. So in partnership with the German government, trying to get one person out of their home, sometimes on the fifth floor of a walk-up, uh, you know, downstairs in an ambulance, you can't cross some of the roads. It's not safe. So they're traveling through fields. They might be, um, their ambulances might be hijacked on the way by Russian soldiers who wanted it uh, for themselves. It was just very complicated to get people um, out and into safety. And it, it really took heroic efforts by volunteers across the world to make this happen. But for many people, um, whether or not they're Holocaust survivors or perhaps they were already displaced in Ukraine from previous fighting to relive multiple traumas at a time is um, complicated. And so we also provide uh, a, a trauma hotlines, trauma therapists that are coming into the countries uh, all across Eastern Europe in Moldova, Romania, Poland, to help work with people, to help them think about you know, what their next steps are and how to take care of their emotional needs. That's, I mean, you just mentioned a number of the, the bordering countries because here we are in, in the U.S. where there are relatively few Ukrainian refugees who have, who have actually come here, but many, many, many more, right, who have uh, traveled to the, the countries immediately uh, bordering Ukraine. I'm wondering if you can, if you can, can, can talk about that sort of um, 
what that has meant kind of from the early days of, of, the, of the war and, and how it has, has changed because it kind of, I know there are even some, some centers that have been closing down like in Mexico City, right? I think the, 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 city has, uh, the center has closed down. Um, people have moved beyond some uh, um, centers in Moldova, um, for example. Yeah, well, I just speak from what I know. You know, it, when some people crossing into countries like Moldova, for example, which is already a very poor country, ill-equipped to accept refugees, there's one set of things that need to happen to help them move on. Uh, in Poland, it was, you know, when I was there, I stayed in Warsaw and then I traveled to Medica, which is the largest border crossing very close to Lvov. And um, in Warsaw, we just saw thousands of people streaming into the main, the central train station and sleeping at the train stations. There are also transit centers or um, shopping malls that have been turned into transit centers where people are sleeping on wooden uh, you know, sort of makeshift beds and they're thinking about what their next steps are. And I was really impressed with how quickly the Polish government um, put into place um, help so people could go into a train station, think about where am I going to go from here? Which city can I go to to find shelter, possibly a job? But most people we saw really wanted to go back. So they weren't leaving. Uh, There's so many displaced families, mothers with children who want to go back to meet their husbands and their sons and uh, fathers that they didn't want to travel very far. Of course, we're helping people who wish to relocate, um, especially in the Jewish community, but not only to Israel. Israel was one of the first countries to open their doors or, um, to refugees. Uh, some are eligible for the law of return and will settle there permanently. Others um, are, are, are applying for citizenship or uh, special visas, but uh, really finding ways to help move people in ways that feel good and authentic to them to meet them where they are in this, in this uh, tragedy. Yeah, I would... Uh only add, uh, I think absolutely we, we've been observing the, the same with, with what Joy uh, is describing, we, we definitely seen um, smaller scale of refugees coming all the way to the U.S. Obviously, that's a that's a long, long way. Um, we still seen hundreds of people crossing the border, and we helped operate uh, first a camp uh, in San Isidro across the border from Tijuana, and then the Mexico City uh, hub that, that you uh, you mentioned. That I guess. We, we, we could close because it, met, it fulfilled its mission. Um, we still seen hundreds of people moving through the border. And while it feels like you're in the United States now and you know, it's, it's much you know, safer and everything, uh, still people are stranded. They cross the border sometimes in the middle of the night. They need transportation. They need a place to stay. It is dangerous to, to just cross the border and be there on your own. Um, so that's, I would say, the biggest, um, the greatest importance of these these hubs was to provide a safe space mm -hmm. for uh, for these people um, as they are continuing their journey and actually helping them continue their journey, helping them with paperwork, helping them uh, with uh, securing you know temporary housing. We've been uh, partnering with with Airbnb um, actually, and really appreciate that partnership. We managed to uh, provide. Um, I believe more than 15,000 vouchers. This is globally, not just in the US, but still um, a huge help for those families that are looking for a place to stay in the first couple of days. Um, so that, that's one aspect I wanted to bring up. I wanted to bring up one more aspect that Jay uh, mentioned already that a lot of people want to move back, and that's why so many of them are trying to be close mm -hmm. to home. Uh, they don't, most people don't want to go far because they really just want to go back home. Um, and the challenging part of the situation is that um, this is natural for people to want to go home. At the same time, um, b people are struggling between uh, this, this being homesick and wanting to be, go home and having some stability and being able to, to think about the future. Um, th the challenge is they don't know when they will be able to go back. Um, so I, I can imagine that, you know, that stress, and this is why some people choose to move to United States, to Canada, to, to farther away locations, because they just want to be able to build their life in a, in a, safe, in a safe place. Um, so it, it is a complex issue, and uh, uh, we, we definitely hope that um, soon enough people will be able to go back and it will be safe. Um, but we also need to understand that some, uh, some people are trying to find to, to 
especially if they're with their, with their families. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're trying to build their, um, you know, their welfare somewhere. That's, I mean, I, I think of one, one friend who's, whose mother stayed behind in Jotomer because I think as, as you, both of you, I, I'm sure know many people, especially elderly people say, where, where am I going to go? This is my home. I've always lived here, right? But so one, my, my friend's sister left and was in Germany, but did, felt like this is, this is not home, right? I mean, I really, um, after months, right, I, I don't have a life here. So she's also back in Jotomer now. Um, and yet there's no safe place, right? Yeah. Um, you, you both talked about it, and we saw in the videos as well, um, the fact that the, the vast majority of the refugees are, these are sp split families or women, women and children who are particularly vulnerable um, as refugees, right? And this is not unique to Ukrainian refugees. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can, can talk about kind of some of the particular concerns. I mean, even with, with human trafficking, it kind of, you know, inevitably becomes one of the, one of the real, real worries as part of this. I mean, I've I worked um, in women's issues for a lot of my career, including the 10 years before I moved here to the Bay Area to work at the Federation. And, you know, women and children are disproportionately affected by war. And certainly as refugees, when they leave, they become very vulnerable. Many of them leave without um, money and they're fleeing very quickly. They have very little. They might be staying in train stations. And even at the border, when I was there just three weeks into the war, um, you know, we were told not to bring anything with us because there are pickpockets, there's people looking to take advantage of vulnerable people at their weakest moments all the time. And it's a stat, it's a, it's a sad statement in the world, but it's also true. So how do we protect people? Uh, and certainly uh, trafficking, human trafficking is a very big issue for women during um, war times and for children. So we have to pay particular attention, especially while they cross borders and they don't have somebody protecting them. One of the things that um, I saw while I was in Poland that I thought was um, really special was how the Polish community was putting many of the refugees to work right away. So um, they are, and you can talk more about volunteerism, and certainly the need for Russian-speaking and Ukrainian volunteers is very high. And there's a, you know, I've gotten a lot of phone calls here. How can, I want to go. I want to volunteer. I want to do something. But what's been really incredible was putting especially the women to work right away in these refugee centers to cook, to sort through donations that were coming in from around the world, uh, to teach school classes, to really, and to pay them for that, which brings a sense of immediate dignity and um, some, you know, some ability to build, uh, you know, financial uh, self-worth again. So here's, here's a, a pretty straightforward question for you, uh, I'll stop. Is Nova Ukraine an organization in Ukraine or in the USA to help Ukraine? Both, uh, actually. Um, so we are our headquarters, so we are founded here in California, in Palo Alto, um, initially. And our focus was always to on on Ukraine, and uh, most of the projects that we execute were uh, executed in Ukraine through the network of partners or our own volunteers. Today, we have a chapter in Ukraine. Um, some volunteers work directly through that chapter. Um, we obviously have our kind of global Nova Ukraine. Um, I want to say headquarters, but we're all remote and work from home these days. So this is not really a, a building or a place. It's a, um, it, it's a place where a lot of us are, are centered um, here in mostly in California, but across US. So it is both. Uh, we both have our volunteers in Ukraine that help coordinate the projects. And we have a huge network of partners in Ukraine that help us execute these projects. Uh, we are very much grassroots initiative. Uh, we are a very lean organization. Um, you know, most we are volunteer-led. You know, all of the uh, board members have full-time jobs, and this is their, I guess, second full-time job. Well, honestly, first full-time job now. Um, and we have very little paid staff, mostly in Ukraine, and this is our way to also pay back into economy. And as Jerry said, it enable people who potentially lost their jobs to help and to continue you know, feed their family and, and um, you know, work and get paid. Um, so it is both here and um, in Ukraine. Um, we are registered 501c3 nonprofit for, for that matter. So I guess if that, if that was the gist of the question.
Yeah, well, and I think, and you both have kind of underscored something that's, again, really important, both in addressing the crisis in the moment, as well as building for the future, kind of finding, assisting with, with livelihoods um, within Ukraine um, or within, within refugee uh, communities, um, you know, letting, letting Ukrainians who want to help provide that kind of leader, leadership and help to, to help one another, providing the funding to, to make, that, make that possible. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, we, we certainly have some interest from uh, folks out here in our audience for those who would want to assist with any refugees who might be here in the Bay Area, even offering their own home, um, if that's something that either of you can, can touch yes, on. Yes, definitely. So the best way to, to go about, um, you know, offering help, we actually created a refugee portal. That was one of the first things we did. In fact, when we were trying to figure out the situation uh, and trying to understand how we can help on the ground directly, we were building this portal so at least we can help informationally. This was the first thing we could do from anywhere in the world. We could collect the information so people don't have to go and search when, when you know, they, they don't have time for this and uh, it's still already stressful. So we built this portal and now that portal transformed from just the information for refugees into a way to connect people who want to help and people who need help and there are different ways to, to help you. Well, the simplest and maybe one of the most effective ones is to donate to these efforts, and that, that is available, that option is available in our portal. But also, people who want to donate housing, there is a way to get in touch through one of the partner organizations to offer housing and be connected with, uh, with the families that need it. Um, we even have a program that is called Adopt a Family. That, um, the, that family, that Ukrainian family can be either in Ukraine or recently relocated and trying to build their new life. Um, and you, you actually, like, donors get to choose the category of, of the families they want to uh, support, and we connect them, and people can directly support the family. We already supported more than 90 families this way. Um, so there, there are uh, all these options listed on Refugee Portal, um, can be found from, from our homepage. Uh, and I believe the links will be distributed afterwards too. Um, so that's probably the best place to start. That's, how, how about you, Joy? I, I think you have great resources and mm -hmm. we've pointed people to many of your resources also. Um, and our Jewish community also, our federation also serves as a community foundation. So it's important to us that we have a lot of partners, Jewish and otherwise that can, you know, we can point uh, our donors too, uh, and our you know another longtime partner here in the East Bay is the uh, 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 the Jewish Family and Children's Services, which has done a lot of re refugee resettlement you know since the 90s here. Uh, so I would suggest people also take a look there to see what they're working on. I'm I'm curious, is, do either of you know of any resources ways for those to try and help people who are in areas right now occupied by uh, Russian forces? I mean, obviously you've got. Kherson, where I observed elections some, some years ago, so I, you know, I, I know folks who are there. Um, obviously, you know, Mariupol and huge swaths of uh, Donbass and Luhansk and Zaporizhia now. Yeah, I can, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, obviously, this is really hard. Uh, and any kind of delivery of any kind of help um, is very risky for volunteers. That being said, some volunteers still evacuate from those areas, and we, we support them. Um, there is usually the way it works, on the way there, they bring supplies, and on the way back, they bring people. So uh, these, these runs always are combined humanitarian um, aid and evacuation. And one, one other way that um, we've been trying to, to support um, refugees who are trying to escape those occupied territories some of them actually manage to escape through Russia. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are forced evacuated. They go through these filtration camps. Um, that terrible stories from, from those. Um, but eventually they end up on Russian territory and they are helped there by, by local volunteers who also obviously taking a lot of risk to move through the, um, through the Finland, uh, through Baltic countries. Um, to Europe, and we we partner with a nonprofit in Germany that that uh, meets them, and we help find housing for them. We help like fund the the first, um, you know, transportation and things like that. So we we even have a project like that. But a as you can see, we have to be get like really really 
creative about what we do because um, there is no straightforward way to, to safely provide aid to, to those areas for obvious reasons. Well, and that's, I think you, you know, you touched on the filtration camps and I, you know, I think maybe if, if you can talk a little, little bit more about those who have been forcefully deported, who are, you know, and in, in UN categorization are actually being called refugees, but um, others beg to differ with that uh, description, I mean, being forcefully deported to, to, to Russia. Um, Unfortunately, we, we hear that the, these are hundreds and thousands uh, of uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And uh, now um, it's very hard to track the exact number of people. Uh, obviously, the visibility into those those territories, what's what's going on there is limited. Um, the fraction of people we can help and fraction of people can actually make their route. Uh, I think we recently even heard that the guidance from um, like official guidance from Ukrainian authorities that if people can uh, make their way out through Russia, they should. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, it, it's very hard to comment on the like destiny of people, of hundreds of thousands of people who um, who haven't made their way out um, and when they will be able to make their way out. Uh, I think this is actually a really important point, which is the vast majority of Ukrainians are still in Ukraine. They're mm -hmm. not actually refugees. So there's both a refugee and a displacement problem at the same time uh, going on. Yeah. So talk, talk more about yeah, that. I, I mean, so people are on the mo tens of thousands of Jews, which means hundreds of thousands, because this is only a microcosm of what's happening there, are on the move in their own country, moving between cities. So for us, we had the infrastructure because we'd been there for 30 years working through this chesed welfare network that they could call from one to the other and a family could say, you know, we have hotlines, first of all, which I wanted to mention, and they are on our website. Anybody can call them Jewish or not Jewish uh, to get help in multiple languages, whether you want to stay or you're looking to leave the country to get um, kind of advice and next steps or trauma counseling, but also to call between cities to help move people, you know, in, in the safest ways possible. But it's very difficult to go in to, to provide direct aid. So having on the ground partners is really key. And I think you do a great job of being nimble to be able to provide the support right where, where people need it. So one of our audience members has actually asked about those returning uh, to, to Ukraine again, um, you know, wondering if, if either, of you, either of you might be able to talk about some numbers of those going back to uh, an uncertain home, an uncertain future. I, I don't have a number on hand, but I can probably share some of the, the information we have from some partners that actually help there. One of the directions that we have, um, like a lot of people who come back, they, they basically are faced, uh, you know, the destruction and um, there is, besides just the building being uh, torn apart, um, there are also, you know, all these Russian tanks that were just left behind in all these city, cities. Um, and we have one um, one program that helps clean up the streets. And we understand, and especially uh, the reason we are doing this, even so eventually we, we hope that the Ukrainian state, Ukrainian government will be able to fund these programs and do this. We also realize that today all the focus is into stopping the aggressor and, and preventing the advance of, of Russian uh, forces. Um, so we as a nonprofit, we, are, we can react more quickly and we can fund these uh, operations that can quickly clean up the streets of the cities. We actually have a group that works in Irpin and Bucha, those uh, cities uh, close to Kiev that, that suffered a lot of destruction. Uh, and they are cleaning up streets. They are helping build, put like temporary, uh, like close off uh, windows or new windows. So actually, we, we are trying to be careful with the new windows at this point, unfortunately. So it's all temporary solutions for people to have uh, to be able to move back um, as they can you know, continue rebuild and repair their homes. Um, so we have some projects like that um, for some people that go back, unfortunately, have to, have to face all of this. Um, again, that's, that's where you know, we can have impact on the ground right now. 
I mean, our Jewish community here in the Bay Area stands on really four pillars. And um, just like chesed, I, I said, is the Hebrew word for compassion. Kehila means community. Sadaka means giving with just intention. Sedek is justice. And tikkun olam is repairing the world. So for us, we see how these things come together to make sure that we're there to support the Ukrainian Jewish community when they're ready to go back or for those who have chosen to stay. So uh, together with the federations across the country, we've still identified urgent humanitarian relief is still needed. Uh, the war is, you know, it's not the first story on the news anymore, but that doesn't mean that the situation has changed for most people. So we're still raising money for urgent humanitarian relief. Uh, and at the same time, starting to think about the next two years and what long-term rebuilding will look like. We've estimated for the Jewish community, it's about $200 million. And our community has already made commitments to think about how we're going to continue to support that. And I feel the Bay Area has been exceptionally generous during this time. And I, I, I hope that there'll be ways that we can continue to talk about what the long-term needs are. You heard me say in the video, you know, we've been working in uh, the former Soviet Union and in, in, in Ukraine for more than 30 years. We've invested as a system hundreds of millions of dollars in rebuilding Jewish life. So this is a great investment uh, that we've made over the years in youth, in leadership, in people who, uh, community members who really want to take responsibility for going home and rebuilding their lives. And we want to be there to support them for that. Well, I think you, you both have also touched on something of tremendous symbolic import of rebuilding Ukraine amidst, amidst this, this horror and destruction at a time when you literally have someone who is intent on erasing Ukraine from the map, erasing Ukraine identi Ukrainian identity and denying its history. Um, I mean, so it, it seems those, those acts within a community of restoring a community, of rebuilding a home, um, that, that, that's something profound. Um, I'm glad you also mentioned Irpin and Bucha because I think a lot people who haven't been there didn't realize those were, you know, these bucolic bedroom communities outside of Kiev before the, right. uh, but before the the, the, the battle uh, raged raged there. One of the members of, of our audience, kind of a couple comments that have come in. One saying they hope the Commonwealth Club will do more programs like this. Um, to make sure that people don't turn away, even though, right, it may not be front front page news anymore, it may not be the top top story in the media, and yet, kind of the most there's very important work to do for the for the long haul as well as the immediate crisis. There's another question that asks about um, current needs and and framing it in the sense of how in the early weeks of the invasion, supplies were mobilized to support refugees. How is the supply chain to the border um, and inside Ukraine holding up today? and what's most needed. I, I can start here. Um, it, while the war has been ongoing for almost four months, um, we, we are still facing pretty much the same same issues. Uh, supply chains are still not, not repaired. Um, supplies to hospitals are not uh, back. And um, it, it's very hard to just focus on one single need. Um, there is just a number of needs, and this was like our choice at, at Nova Ukraine was that we will distribute the help into the number of these needs. And there is a big medical need, and that includes first aid, medicine that literally saves lives of people. Uh, that includes medicine for hospitals. A lot of hospitals are lacking basic medicine, or my, a lot of them more advanced medicine, that because the supply chains are not there and financing of hospitals is not there yet. Uh, medical equipment that especially that that is needed right now to diagnose people who get who receive uh, traumas from shellings and, and um, things like you know, x-rays and, and um, ultrasounds and stuff like that um, so there is a big medical need and we are still more than the majority of, of, of the funds that we deploy uh, more than 50 percent are focused on that and on different categories within that medical big medical category including the in-kind donations that we ship uh, from from a lot of them from the U.S. where we get them. Um, there is also humanitarian, like basic basic supplies. And just to illustrate, uh, not, not necessarily to our focus on this example, but to illustrate that um, one of the things that we, we've, we saw on the ground is there are these local producers that lost their distribution chains. Mm -hmm. 
and they are basically forced to close their production. Um, and I mean production of like basic, you know, food, um, right? Um, and uh, while we we hope that that supply chain, that distribution chain is re rebuilt, at the same time, one of the pro projects that we did was, can we provide grants, like one-time grants to them so they can continue operations and feed people, right? So um, to me, the situation feels like, uh, obviously there are a lot of people who want to help, um, but the links are broken. And sometimes it's transportation links, sometimes it's a logistic link, um, sometimes it's purely you know, finance, financial, um, like in finance. And we are here, like the way we, we are trying to get, keep, keep tabs on where we can apply our help to, to have the highest leverage. Like, can we uh, provide a grant to this factory that can then provide food for free to people who need food and can buy it and maybe don't have means to, to purchase it. Um, so we, we are looking for those ways where we can have the biggest leverage and, and deploy our help quickly. Uh, that's our strong part. Obviously, on the scale of the country, um, we, we deployed $22 million so far. It's small, but um, right now it's having big impact. Um, so that's, that's kind of our focus. And what exactly needs help, I think, these specific areas need support right now. Medical, basic needs, um, still evacuation, even so luckily evacuation volumes were, were getting lower. Um, and definitely the refugees, definitely people who, who had to move their home and uh, internally displaced people, of course. Um, so all of those areas need, need focus right now. And I would just, I, I would just expand and add that we're, you know, we're here to talk about Ukraine, but it's World Refugee Day. And I think one thing that most of us have learned during this time, particularly as it relates to Ukraine, is their importance as a grain producer in the world and how it has um, just had a domino effect for people around the world that rely on um, you know, different uh, uh, world food programs. And there are refugees around the world that are suffering that are outside of Ukraine as well. And I think it's just worth mentioning here and how we think about you know the kind of support we want to give worldwide on a day like this well and a, and, and a supply chain issue comes kind of front and center mm -hmm. there where there's actually grain that can't get out of ukraine um, and then there's the stolen grain that russia is offering to sell to egypt um, you know what kind of certificate do you need to say where this grain is from and you know and it's yours um, one this is actually one of the questions that's, that's also come in, come in from the audience was um, how refugees who are uh, leaving Ukraine at the beginning who are not not Ukrainian, um, what their experience were were at the border, whether from Africa or from Asia, if there were particular uh, difficulties that, that that they faced. I, I can uh, say that um, definitely the, they had it harder because a lot of programs were focused on Ukraine nationals. Um, we don't necessarily have a huge experience um, with, with specifically this, this category of people, and especially because our efforts are more focused in Ukraine and those who moved all the way to Mexico or to, to North America. Um, but I can just confirm that definitely, even some of the countries, neighboring countries are doing a lot, and we 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 absolutely grateful for what they do. But you, those people caught themselves in a situation where um, like the process is not necessarily um, kind of focused around their their use case, as we tend to say you know, in technical terms. Um, so that that is that is a fact. Um, can add too much to that, uh, but uh, the important part is having people on the ground, having um, you know, hotlines right where people can reach out to, um, safe space of course that gives time to to figure things out. Um, all of those are important and equally applicable, regardless if this is Ukrainian national, non-Ukrainian national. And one of the one of the first things that you see when you literally cross through the gate in Medica from Ukraine into Poland is a medical tent that's run by the Israeli government. And uh, someone on our trip asked, we were traveling with the chief rabbi of Poland, well, how do you know who's Jewish? And he said, you don't, and it doesn't matter, right? The, the help is there for anybody who makes it across, who can find the resources um, to call a hotline to get help. And so it is without, without um, you know, any restrictions. And one of the things that was really interesting uh, watching this unfold, uh, 
a lot of it is unfolding on social media uh, in different ways. And I don't know if you, you know, you've, you've seen this also, and I, I saw your videos from, you know, Instagram and trying to talk to people about what's happening, but um, lots of refugees and internally displaced people are sharing their own stories in their own words on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, on all sorts of social media networks. And I hope that people around the country can also find this as a source of support for each other. And I think that's unlike pretty much any day modern war that we have ever seen. It's really incredible uh, how neighbors have come together to help each other in this way. Well, I think one of the other things I, I know that we've talked about, your organization has also worked with refugees from Ethiopia mm -hmm. as well. Maybe we can you talk, talk some about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the Jewish community uh, is a small one worldwide. And part of our work with our overseas partner, uh, JDC, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, is to provide relief to Jewish communities that need it to renew Jewish life and also to rescue Jews wherever they are in need. And there are Jews that live in most countries. And right now, um, there was just just uh, in the midst of this war in Ukraine, also a really significant um, a trip from Ethiopia to Israel, bringing Ethiopians that had been waiting uh, to be re reunified with their families uh, as part of a humanitarian mission. So to be able to partake in all of these things at the same time, the world is very complicated right now. Things are happening at a fast pace and um, we have to be able to respond just as quickly as it's happening. So um, making sure that you know our energies uh, can also be used to, you know, help our cousins in Ethiopia is very important to us as a Jewish community and other places in the world, and includes Russia, by the way. So, you know, we there are twice as many Jews that are living in Russia as in Ukraine, and so it's really important for us that we make sure that our system of, you know, welfare centers stays operational and can help uh, folks that are living there as well. And so we have to take all of these things into account when you know we 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 want to protect and serve our jewish community so you mentioned social media and the the value of it of course one of the one of the factors um, of social media amidst this war has been the disinformation and misinformation that's that's been a part of it i'm wondering if either of you can talk about that in connection with with refugee uh issues in particular so i i would say um maybe for a slightly different angle mm -hmm. um Obviously, there are good, good and bad sides of everything. And um, with with the social media, well, social media did create an outlet for organization like ours, right? And definitely, with a lot of focus on Ukraine right now, we were able to to be present on on the you know old style media, right, on the TV. Um, but generally, this is how we reach out to our to our supporters. And one other thing to understand that a lot, well, when we talk about misinformation, we talk about financed, like really well-financed campaigns. And that's something that we've seen happening from the Russian side for right. many, many years. And how do we tackle that with much smaller resources like organization like ours? We just have to be out there. We, we have to speak our truths. We have to uh, tell people what's going on. And I'm very grateful to to Commonwealth Club and to everyone who invites us to be present in front of the audience um, and uh, tackle this this misinformation. Um, obviously, the misinformation on social media is a hard hard topic, uh, not really solved. Um, but that being said, we just have to like our job. We see our mission as to be in front of people, telling what's happening. This is part of our mission as Nova Ukraine. Um, this is how being, we've been approaching it. I just add that, you know, that's part of why I went on this trip yep. is to say, you know, and to come back and say, you know, I saw this with my own eyes. I met these people. Um, they're real. Their stories are real. And it's so important to to be able to share that firsthand. I've, I have two little girls. They're in, um, they just graduated from, um, uh, third and sixth grade, and I spoke to their classes and some other schools around town. And you know, they ask me such great questions. Their questions are are so hard for the middle school questions. But you know, what changed? Did anything change when I saw? You know, they're studying primary sources. Mm -hmm. So what changed? And of course, when you meet 
people. These are human beings that are just like us that have been pulled from their lives really unexpectedly. And I think, uh, you know, the only thing that we can really do is meet them, meet their needs in the way that helps them in the ways that they want it uh, and be there with compassion and love. And then to share that with people to kind of combat whatever misinformation is out there. And tell their stories. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We've seen a lot of that. There is a there, especially at the start of the war. There was huge lack of uh, information and any media resource we talked to. They were asking like, "Do you have any uh, recordings, videos from the ground?" Um, that was really lacking. And yet, at the same time, of course, I think as many of our audience members know as well, right? That um, that Volodymyr Zelensky, in, in particular, right, and and U Ukraine has actually. Um, really distinguish itself um, in getting its message out there again and again and again um, and countering um, sort of much more old school, heavy handed um, Soviet style propaganda, frankly. Um, even, even, I mean, of course, we've seen newspapers that have come out recently, as, you know, Ukraine has given up on Zaporizhia, you know, trying to uh, con convince people in occupied territories that um, your country has given up on you. Um, by, by printing it somehow, making uh, making people think it will be true. There's there's someone here from the audience who wants to know about um, writing to refugees, um, if um, sen sending letters, reaching out to people. Um, do you know of any any resources for that? Would you have any suggestions or recommendations? Well, I think that's great, and I think there are a lot of school children in particular that mm -hmm. would love to be able to show some support, and I'd be happy to look into it. I don't have a resource offhand. Um, other than saying the Polish Jewish community um, has welcomed just, you know, um, hundreds of families. And this is a community that was not well equipped to even take care of themselves, so to speak. You know, this, they were used to being taken care of because they were a very vulnerable population also. Yep. So bringing them into schools, um, you know, they've welcomed them with open arms. But anything that we can do to facilitate making people feel like they're people on the other side of the ocean that care about them, I think is great, especially for young kids who are gonna carry this with them their whole lives. And you know, I worry about that a lot. So we'd be happy to look into that. And maybe you have some resources too. We'd be happy uh, to share them. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely agree with, with what you said, Joy. Um, we, we don't necessarily have a program specifically for writing letters, but I would just say anyone who has any, any sort of support in mind, uh, any idea of support, you can just reach out to refugees at NovaUkraine.org and and share uh, the what what you have in mind, and we are we are welcoming uh, you know any any type of support, and this kind of support, very personal, is just is so valuable. Part of why we created Adopt a Family program to also create a connection. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it it's not just you know some random donation, faceless donor. It's a, it's a connection between those don well families write back to the donors and the donors can write a letter to the family too. Well, it's, and actually another member of the audience is wondering if we can come back to if we know how many refugees are have made it to the U.S. or to the to the Bay Area. I can follow up with a number. I don't have a number on hand. Uh, we uh, we can try to estimate the number because we know when. Uh, when the people were crossing the border in Tijuana, we've been seeing up to 500, 600 people per day. Mm -hmm. And we can estimate that that has been running for a um, couple of weeks. Um, so that would be a few thousand people there. But now, um, right now, we don't really have a number, like only U.S. State Department has that number because people are now coming with, with the United for Ukraine program are coming from all over. They're not necessarily crossing the Mexico border. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that, that there is a large scale of, of, of people there. Uh, we didn't do our own research on the number of um, people who moved to, to the Bay Area. Obviously, we, we have a number of families we communicate with and provide help, uh, but that wouldn't be you know, statistically correct to say uh, that we've seen every, every refugee family. Um, but yeah, we de definitely can follow up with the team if they have better estimates uh, afterwards. So I'd like to, if, if I may, come back to um, a sense of place and your own personal connections. Um, Joy, you, you lived and worked in Dnipro, where your, your grandparents are from once upon a time. 
I'll stop. You're from, from Lviv. Your co-founder is from Kharkiv. Um, so you kind of got this, the span of the, the country. And we have Odessa and Kiev on the board. Uh, we, we have uh, people from all over. So I'm wondering, yes, yeah, so if you can talk about the, the ge geographic reach of the work that you're doing within, within the, the country. or. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we are trying to focus our efforts where the help is most needed. Mm -hmm. um, so it, we do reassess uh, something we internally call critical regions. Um, pretty much weekly, we assess like which regions are critical, and usually those are the closest to the um, to the basically the the, the line um, where where active fighting is happening. Um, we also are trying to think a little bit ahead because even so we are quick and nimble, uh, it's still some projects require a couple of weeks to implement. Like for example, equipping a bomb shelter uh, takes at least a week or two to implement. Um, and we need to think ahead where people would need the bomb shelters the most. Um, we did equip bomb shelters in Mykolaiv um, probably a month ago, a little more than that. And that was the right call because we, there have been so many shellings of, of Mykolaiv. Um, Sometimes we, we kind of have to just make the best guess based on the information possible. Um, but most of the time, the help is needed right now. We know which locations we get most evacuation requests, or uh, we, our volunteers are right there on the ground. We, they can tell us what the situation is like, and we reassess. So most of the help is going towards the, those eastern regions that are very close to the um, division line right now. Um, but also have to remember, Western Ukraine, all of the IDPs are there. So if you need to equip the temporary housing, that's where it goes. Um, kind of basic uh, aid uh, goes there too. And it'll, it, the, the dynamics is uh, just very complex. A lot of injured people are evacuated farther away. So we, we are working with, with organizations that have access to all this data. How many patients are in different hospitals? How much um, how these requests are from hospitals are coordinated? So it's uh, we don't we we are tapping into this database where we know exactly this hospital needs more than this one right now. So we have to focus our effort there. We want to help everyone, but we have to prioritize all the time. I mean, we have members of our Jewish community all over Ukraine. Right. Um, you know, before the before World War II, there were you know millions of Jews that were living there. And so they've stayed in a lot of the same pockets of big cities, uh, many of which you've already mentioned, you know, Kiev, Odessa, Dnepro, um, Kharkov. Um, and these are cities that have really rich Jewish histories that we want to make sure we support. Um, because we've worked there for a long time, um, I, I, I would say, you know, for us, every Jew counts and um, we pay attention to that. There are... Um, about a dozen Jews, not, I think maybe maybe 10 that are 105 years that are or older, and we know exactly where they live. They're not leaving, you know, they don't want to be evacuated or they can't leave. So really knowing and having an infrastructure that can, you know, take care of people where they are has been really important to us during this war and will continue to be, I guess. So let me ask a, a big question. So what, right now, what gives you hope? I think that, you know, like a next generation and youth that have stayed, I, I've been really impressed with so many people who've stayed behind, including women and children, to build their communities, to protect their communities, in some cases to fight. Um, and certainly we have um, an active Jewish teen network around uh, the countries of the former Soviet Union, including in Ukraine that we support through JDC and seeing people who, you know, will stay to make sure that people have their basic needs met and meet them where they are in community is important. Not that long ago, we celebrated the Jewish holiday of Passover, which is one of, uh, you know, a story recounting uh, slavery to freedom. We celebrated uh, uh, Passover in all of the countries surrounding Ukraine so that Ukrainian refugees could participate in this and in virtual seders uh, throughout Ukraine, about nine of them. A lot of the matzah that we eat during Passover is actually produced in Ukraine and they continued to operate their factory while they were uh, in the midst of war. And I think it's a story of resilience um, that really echoes across generations and that there's a next generation that wants to lead and stay and protect is really inspiring to me for, for sure. Yeah, Israeli community definitely has a long, long history of um, you know, 
uh, resilience and and Ukrainian community too. And in a way, Ukraine is such an old nation, but such a young country. And uh, we, you, you asked Simon what gives us hope, and I. The only thing that comes to my to or the main thing that comes to my mind is uh, it's we have to win mm -hmm. this war. We we have no choice to to lose it because we we lose our country, and that's the only choice we have. And also personal choice is to support and help Ukraine now. Um, all of the people who in no Ukraine and other organizations they made this this choice that. They will put their time, effort, funds, everything into helping Ukraine to win. Um, we know this is going to happen. I, I just can't even imagine in my mind any other outcome. Um, our mission is to to support Ukraine through this fight, uh, and we, we we know this fight will will we will win this fight. We have to. For, not just for Ukraine, but honestly, we're on the forefront of, of you know, modern values and, and the territorial integrity of countries in, in the modern world. Um, we don't really have any other choice than to win this war. Um, we also know that our mission won't finish there, and we'll, we'll have to continue supporting. This is a long, um, this is a long run for us, mm -hmm. um, but. We, we see a, a huge importance and value in this for our country, for our people, um, regardless of where they are, um, but es especially for, for, for Ukraine. I think many, many people in our audience in the last few months became familiar for the first time with the Ukrainian national anthem, Shetnev Merola Ukraina, right? Which translates as uh, Ukraine is not defeated, or Ukraine uh, have, haven't, haven't been defeated, basically. Yeah, has not perished yet, yeah, yeah. Which, which seems like an important place to, to start for the, the, the story that we're, we're trying to, to tell going forward. I guess I, you know, I also can't help but thinking about you know, what you were talking about earlier, Joy, and the kind of concerns with the World Food Program and the impact of whatever happens in Ukraine globally. Um, you know, that if food is being weaponized, that's of course meant to create a whole cascade of refugee crises um, that, you know, so that it will not, it will not stop just with the, the values of Ukraine and the, what happens with democracy, but what happens in countries across, especially across North Africa, um, I think is some of, the, some of the deepest concerns. Yes, well, you know, so I mentioned that our Jewish Community Federation serves as our community foundation. Um, we steward more than $2 billion in assets. We make more than $200 million in grants every year to, you know, thousands of charities, uh, Jewish and not Jewish, around the world. And, you know, I guess this is the right kind of forum and day to remind people that there's suffering around the world, uh, certainly in Ukraine, in the countries that surround it, and all over the world. And uh, women and children who are displaced by war, men who are suffering uh, in ways that we haven't imagined. And, you know, I hope, I, I, you know, another thing to be inspired by is just the generosity of the Bay Area mm -hmm. community in their response, uh, welcoming refugees here, donating to causes. And, you know, I would hope that today is a day that we think about refugees around the world and how we can support them philanthropically through volunteerism and just any ways that feel meaningful in creating the kind of world we want to live in. Yeah, to, to just add Ukrainian context um, uh, to, to, to this, um, clearly, like, there are so many, and the world is, is seeing the, the aftermath of war, not just in Ukraine. Um, it just seems logical to me that what, what the world should do, the world has to stand against the Russian aggression. And the mission of our nonprofit is purely humanitarian, but one thing we need to understand that in order to stop this war, there needs to be military aid to Ukraine that, that cannot stop. Um, Ukraine has been absolutely bravely defending um, the country and its territory, uh, but without Western allies, uh, I, I don't believe Ukraine can, can, can stop this, can stop Russia. So 
a lot of the conversation, um, as, as we're wrapping up here, I um, want to share a real re brief story and ask you a question. Um, back in 2014, I was observing you know, an election in, in Carson, actually. I was in a, in a market on the evening of election day, um, getting some food before I went to a polling station that was going to close, and a woman behind me saw my, my armband with the OSCE um, and asked if I was an observer and thanked me for being there. Um, and she said, you know, the last years have been like um, living under slavery. It's been like living under bandits. You know, Putin's a bandit too. The young people of Ukraine are smart. They deserve a chance to have a future. So how do we ensure that they have a future? I think the important thing, and this is something that we've, we've put in our mission, no Ukraine is supporting civil society. We, we want Ukrainians to have this bright future in Ukraine. Uh, we want um, these, you know, the, the strong civil society, rule of law. Um, Ukrainians have European values, but Ukrainians have went through um, generations of not having private property, not having, um, you know, ability to achieve through your, you know, your skills, your your um, knowledge, education but rather through like serving the party, right? Or um, this is, there is like a lot of, you, you have to understand that there's been generations where Ukrainians have been uh, oppressed and not given a way to build their, their well-being. Uh, and now we are trying to, to revert that and it will take time. Um, but we, we see that Ukrainians are really, um, determined to do it and when when we talk to to these what that's one of the things of that i'm really inspired about um when i talk to these groups to these um grassroots movements in ukraine that create um you know social uh, entrepreneurs um they create online courses uh they try to educate people they try to uh, build basically their business around actually giving back to the community. And I'm absolutely inspired by them. And they, they thank us for the help, for the grants we provide, usually not, not huge amounts, but it makes a huge difference for them. And I thank them for being there, for doing this, because this wouldn't be possible without them. And for us, we believe that Ukrainians are the ones that will build their own future, right? Ukrainians in Ukraine. Uh, we are here to, to support them and support this, this these grassroots movements, um, it, it has to happen you know, from, from the ground up. Um, every Ukrainian, if it's given an opportunity uh, to, to achieve something bigger, something better for themselves and their family and their country, will build a very prosperous country. This is what, what, how we think about it, and this is why we're putting so much focus on education, um, helping support these grassroots initiatives. Um, this is a very long game. It will not pay off immediately, but it will pay off through a generation, two generations. And that's what you know, keeps, keeps us doing it. And I'm, sh I'm sure Joy has uh, a similar. Well, similar actually, stuff. what you're making me think about, I lived in Ukraine in 2007 and eight in Nepro, and I started a, an organization called Do Good Ukraine, which was to build civil society through volunteerism by connecting individuals. And we had limited technology then uh, and nonprofits and um, businesses to think about how they could create the kind of community that they wanted. And it was operating in 14 cities. And at the time in 2007, which isn't a generation ago, you know, people were still asking the question to me about, you know, why should I volunteer? I'm not getting paid for this or why, why should I do it? And I think your examples just show how far we've come since then. Absolutely. So anything is possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And the interesting highlight recently I learned the Kiev School of Economics started a master's program on fundraising. And um, so this is becoming, you know, Ukrainians got pretty good at it and now we're like institutionalizing it, right? Um, I think that, that that means a lot, just how much Ukrainians get together to help to help the bigger cause. Um, I, that gives me a lot of hope and a lot of uh, trust.
Well, thank you both, uh, Joy Sisiski and Ostap Gorkuna, for uh, joining us here today. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating. Uh, if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. Thank you, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.